a priori to understand that each of these pillars are connected. And, uh, you know, some of our patients or, you know, people we know who ask us advice, want to know, is there one particular pillar they should focus in on? And um, I would suggest at the end of this discussion, as we uh, wrap it up, we will put that all together for you. And uh, they're probably not mutually exclusive. So really, the, the first uh, issue with exercise, I want to just make a case for why we exercise. And um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the barriers of exercise and uh, how that's been amplified by the, the COVID virus. And then we're going to wrap up uh, on some of my thoughts on uh, how to exercise. Okay, so that's the, the summary. Um, so why exercise? And, and really, we think about exercise or the lack of exercise as an independent risk factor for, for all sorts of disease. And inactivity is detrimental to one's health. So physical health is improved tremendously with exercise. And uh, we understand the science and the biology of this. And as I meet with each of my patients, I try to spend some time explaining why exercise is healthy. And the, probably the most powerful physical attribute to exercise is this uh, improvement in metabolism, the improvement in uh, vascular health and the decrease in inflammation. And if, if I think about the common pathway to chronic disease like heart disease and vascular disease or even cancer, uh, uh, inflammation seems to be the common pathway. And exercise is probably the most powerful way we can mitigate inflammation. So it helps with balance and proprioception. It helps with bone density. It helps with muscle tone and muscle mass. And these are the kinds of things that keep that protect you not only against disease, but against injury. Mental health is incredibly uh, uh, impacted by exercise. And, and we know that exercise over time in a regular basis not only helps your, your sense of health and, and a sense of self, but it also improves cognitive function and your ability to think clearly. Um, it, it's something that helps to refresh the system. And uh, when you exercise, you eliminate uh, toxic substances as well, and you utilize energy uh, and in, in a healthy way. Um, the exercise can also really help uh, with social uh, interactions and, and uh, there are certain exercises that one can only do socially and there are other exercises that you can isolate yourself and actually escape from uh, the rest of your stressors as we'll, we'll talk about uh, later. But um, time away from our usual activities and, and exercise can really be beneficial for the mental health. So Brian, Pref there's a question yes. if I can ask yes. you to come into the chat and that is, is there a certain level of intensity of exercise? So we have a vast array of different people who are joining us today. Thank you all so much for being part of today. Is there a certain amount of time or a certain level of intensity? Help us understand that more. Yeah, so, so excellent. Um, and that was getting a little bit uh, ahead of what I was going to talk about, the how, the, the, the how to exercise. But the why of exercise and different kinds of exercise will uh, uh, have impact on various aspects of our, our, of our health. So when we talk to our patients who have coronary artery disease or vascular disease, we want sustained levels of activity. And I, I would say if, if there's ever a barrier to a physical activity, the concept of sustaining movement for a period of time and the magic number seems to be about 15 minutes because that's when the body starts releasing substances that decrease inflammation. You, you release nitric oxide and other kinds of uh, healthy uh, uh, met metabolites that help to scavenge free radicals and help with the, the integrity or the health of the blood vessels and decrease inflammation. So 15 minutes and then the frequency of exercise um, needs to be, there cannot be more than one day without exercise. So uh, when we think of the ideal, it's at least five days a week and that way you're not skipping more than one day a week of exercise. And so the, the minimum 15 minutes and then five days a week 
But when you increase the level of activity and you increase the time or the endurance of the exercise, you, your, your benefits add up. So if you're starting off in an exercise program, it's really important not to have this ideal that I'm going to spend an hour in the gym and I'm going to sweat uh, heavily and I'm going to push myself because that becomes a barrier. So if there's a notion of increasing your ability to exercise and, and uh, start off slowly, gradually, and, and uh, increase over time. So then we look at um, the intensity of exercise. The higher the intensity of exercise, obviously the, the, the more work your muscles have to do uh, and there can be a level of strain or stress to your system if you overdo things. But if you're starting off on a program, I would say in, a, in a anaerobic, uh, I mean in an aerobic capacity, which is uh, a healthy, moderate pace, and to do it for about 20 minutes, uh, five. You see, I've increased from 15 to 20 minutes already. That's what I do with my patients. Um, you know, and, and, and now I'm going to tell you that at least 30 minutes, five days a week. Um, and then if you do interval types of training, you improve your muscle contraction, you improve energy metabolism, and you actually help uh, slow down the aging process. Uh, of cells. So uh, if you want heart health, sustained levels of physical activity, uh, if you want uh, to slow aging, you have to add in some high intensity interval training, which in increases your heart rate and your body, uh, the work your body has to do to a point where you're actually um, stressing your system or becoming slightly anaerobic and then you recover and then you push yourself and then you recover over a period of uh, intervals of 30 seconds up to five minutes uh, intermittently and give yourself a chance to recover in between. So I think that that's the, uh, the ideal of exercise. And I think there's so many barriers um, to exercise that we need to overcome. And if we think of it as a, a gradual, low level, a, achievable goal, I think it's important. And so I think one of the things you alluded to initially was this, this uh, notion that uh, COVID has caused so much stress um, and has been a, a significant barrier, uh, not only by decreasing motivation, but uh, the desire, but also the access to, to exercise. And if you live in the Northeast, you have a barrier of the weather and you have to be very creative. What's been truly amazing to me about this COVID area or arena or this year has been how creative and how people have overcome uh, all of their barriers uh, to exercise in a successful way and on, and on a regular basis. So I think um, I'm not going to speak too much more about this, but I have a lot to say, obviously. Um, but how we exercise is important. So I want everyone to be able to set realistic goals, not goals that are not achievable or attainable, uh, as far as uh, goals that are realistic as far as time and your commitments, uh, as well as uh, you know the ability to uh, be in an environment that is safe because exercise with, with injury is not something we want. We want to exercise safely and avoid injury. Um, and we want to use, um, you know, we, we can use technology. We can use, uh, there's been a lot of creative Zoom interactive uh, meetings and, and coaching sessions and, and gyms are about to open, which I'm not that keen about yet because I don't think we're ready but uh, outdoor activities are uh, incredibly self safe uh, but if we can um, use the kinds of technologies that motivate us to exercise regularly um, and one of the technologies I always recommend is music uh, this is something that we have to uh, integrate it motivates people to exercise more uh, and longer and uh, harder and more intense and it can be a wonderful way of, of exercising and, and again help with the mental the physical and also help prevent uh, uh, injuries i have a lot to say about the the technologies that are around all the monitors that people are using all the the pieces of equipment that have uh, uh, you know just come to light there's been so many stories i'd love to uh, share at some point but i'm going to respect everyone else's time and uh, move on. So before we move on, can each and every participant please type the following into the chat? 
during COVID, have you exercised less than you did before? Please put an L into the chat. Have you exercised more than you did before? Put an M into the chat. An L, an M, or an S for the same. Some people are more, some people are less, and it's the same. Some people are less, some people are more than some people are the same. Thank you for letting us know. Because some of you during COVID, you've just gone on and do the somethings. For a lot of people worldwide, they say you're going to emerge as a chunk or in a funk or a drunk. But I see a lot of people are the same. Some people are more. Thank you for letting us know. Thank you for your input. More, some people less. I see we have a very active group here. Brian, there are a couple of questions that we'll come to at the end. So those of you who have got questions, we'll come to at the end. But we want to get on to Dr. Lee Lewis who is going to be talking about another pillar and a very important one, and that is nutrition. So again, ask yourself, has your nutrition got better? This is a rhetorical question. Is your nutrition declined because you're eating more or is it the same? So how many people have put on weight? Put a Y into the chat. If you put on at least two pounds during the last year, put a Y into the chat if you put on more than two pounds since March of 2020. Thank you. Dr. Lewis, I know you're going to be talking not only about weight gain and loss, but nutrition, 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 one of the pillars of well-being. Thank you, Nadia. And thank you for leading us off with that introduction, because I would say in my experience with my patients, uh, some patients have been eating much, much better because the restaurants are closed and they're cooking more at home. Um, but a lot of patients are eating more of everything because they're working from home and working in proximity to their refrigerator and their pantry. And it is very difficult to resist the call of the pantry. And so I do want to talk about nutrition in general and for heart health. And I also want to talk about it as it affects all of us in the last 10 months and will continue to. So let me just share my screen for a moment here. And one thing I wanna emphasize is these webinars are really about not just health, but also wellness. And when it comes to nutrition, there's two goals. Our goal is for you to be healthy, free of physical and mental disease, free of heart attack and free of stroke. But not only that, We'd love you to take it the next step and feel well. And, and my emphasis in pink there is on balance in your life, on vitality, enjoyment, finding meaning and finding purpose. And it's not just about being free of disease, but it's also about feeling wonderful and feeling great. And the way nutrition plays into that is it's not just about weight loss. So my patients ask me, what's the best diet I can eat? And I ask them first, well, what's your goal? Because if your goal is weight loss, then it's a whole different conversation. And there are diets that promote weight loss, but that's not generally my goal for my patients. My goal for my patients is wellness. My goal is free of heart attack and stroke. My goal is energy, bowels moving well, general health, sleeping. And to that end, there's actually an answer to this question. And the answer is the Mediterranean style diet, which is a largely plant-based, whole food, unprocessed diet is really the only diet that's been studied and it's been studied in many, many studies all over the world in different populations, people who've had heart attacks, people who have never had a heart attack, diabetics, non-diabetics, high cholesterol. And over and over again, this diet has been shown to reduce the risk of heart attack and stroke by about 20 to 30%. And the diet consists primarily of, it can be defined in different ways, but it's really the way that people eat along the Mediterranean coast. And it started out by observing that people in certain parts of the world tended to live longer, had fewer uh, cancer diagnoses, fewer heart attacks and strokes, and overall longevity was better. And so many people started to study what was it about that diet, lifestyle, climate, what was it? And it turns out a large part of that is in fact the way that people eat. And so at this pyramid that sort of summarizes the Mediterranean diet, You'll notice at the bottom, this isn't food, but it's about being physically active as Brian was just talking about, and also about the ways that people eat. So enjoying meals with other people, sitting down, preparing them at home, et cetera. And then at the base of the pyramid, the bulk of the food should consist of grains. And a lot of people are on a low carb diet, which we'll get to later, but grains that are unprocessed. 
so the whole grain, so not white flour, which would be what's found in most muffins, cakes, breads, not white pasta, not white rice, but the whole grains, the unprocessed grains, so oatmeal, brown rice, whole wheat, etc. Fruits and vegetables, and a recent study just came out this week showing that three vegetables, three servings of vegetables and two servings of fruits a day seems to be the optimal for heart risk. And going above that doesn't necessarily give you a lot more benefit, which was good news for a lot of us who were trying to get to the five to nine servings a day, which can be really hard. So three servings of vegetables, generally speaking, the leafy deep colored vegetables, not the peas and potatoes and corn, but the broccoli, lettuce, kale, peppers, that kind of vegetable, three vegetables, two fruits a day. Also beans, nuts, legumes, seeds, and things like that with protein source being primarily, if it can be fish and seafood, and then to a lesser extent, poultry, and to a lesser extent, dairy products. And then at the top of the pyramid there would be red meats and sweets that have, you know, I never like to say never for any kind of food, everything in moderation, but really red meat and sweets have a small role. And again, we're talking about wellness and enjoyment of your food, and there's cultural and social aspects to food that might cause you to choose something at the top of the pyramid now and then, and that's totally fine. Um, water as the primary beverage and wine in moderation. So that would be sort of a summary of the Mediterranean eating habits that, sent, that, that actually do reduce risk. Um, and this summary slide looks at the, the biggest study of the Mediterranean diet that came out of Lyon, France, and it looked at cardiac death and heart attack and other related endpoints. And in study after study, the Mediterranean diet shown up here, the typical Western diet shown here, showed that the event-free survival, so the percent of people who did not have an event, was statistically, significantly, greatly improved in people who followed a Mediterranean versus the typical Western diet. Okay, so thank you all, and that was brilliantly explained, and I think there's so many myths around, should we be on low carbs or high carbs or keto? I just want to make sure for technical reasons, people are saying that Brian Bilchik is showing up as an active speaker. Is everybody seeing Dr. Lee Lewis now as she's speaking? I just want to make sure you're all seeing her beautiful face as she is speaking. Is everybody seeing her? Yes, yes now. Excellent. Thank you. This is the joy of being in a technical space. Is we good? No, Margaret says no. Margaret, if you can't see us or you can't see her, go to the right hand side of your screen and where it says view, just put gallery view. It says that we may want to unspotlight, uh, remove spotlight from Dr. Bilchik for some reason. Is that better? Can you see everybody? Good. Yes, she and Brian look terrific. Thank you for that. So, of course, the advertising industry, Dr. Lewis, is out there telling us what we should and shouldn't eat. There's a very good Netflix series called Explained, and it explains weight loss in exactly the way you did and just how important it is that there's balance. And I think we are all so prone to thinking there's a quick fix, right? So, right. And, and again, if your goal is weight loss, then this conversation is really not about weight loss. And the Mediterranean diet has not been shown to promote weight loss, but you're absolutely right that if you are able to focus on intuitive eating, healthy patterns of eating, keeping your body active, very often weight loss will follow naturally. I just want to emphasize that that's not the goal. The goal is to put into your body what it needs to get through the day. What is the fuel your body needs? And every calorie is either a protein, a fat, or a carbohydrate, every single calorie. And if you're going to get 1,500, 1,800 calories in a day, it's either going to come from protein, fat, or carbohydrate, or a mixture of those. So what you want to do is have some of all of them, really, because proteins, you just want to choose a healthy protein. So fish, nuts, beans, healthy fats. So those would be plant, plant fats that uh, and, and fish fats. So omega-3 uh, fatty acids are the healthiest kind of fat that's found in seafood. It's found in walnuts and nuts. And then fats that are liquid at room temperature, like olive oil, would be the healthier fats. And avoiding the solid fats at room temperature, which would be butter and cream cheese and sour cream and red meat. And then for carbs, there's healthy carbs and unhealthy carbs, and the healthy ones being the unprocessed whole grains. So having a balance of those three is really optimal for your microbiome, which is the gut bacteria, 
that determine so many things about our health, in including our vascular health, including our cholesterol, including our mood and our sleep. So finding a balance of foods that is both healthy and tasty, which was what the next slide I was going to get to is really, it's a challenge for all of us. And I'm just going to show that slide because as the mother of a 12 year old boy and the wife of a picky husband, we're constantly trying to find this purple zone in there. And lots of people live in the pink where they don't really care if it's healthy or not, but it tastes good. And a lot of people live a lot in the blue where they don't care if it tastes good and it, they might hate it, but they force down the oatmeal and the green tea, hoping that it's going to bring them health. But my uh, hope and mission in my patients and in my family and in myself is to try to find ways that we can kind of live in that purple zone because if we can find the foods that are both healthy for us and nourish our souls and our spirits, well then, you know, it's three opportunities a day to bring joy into our lives and, and we could all use a little bit of that. Any questions or anything Dr. Blatt, Dr. Hedgepeth, Dr. Bilchik wants to ask, add, because I I'll, know I'll jump in here. Yes. Um, because I, I love that slide, Dara, and I, I really think it's important for us to really be enjoying the things we eat and not feel tortured by our diet. Yeah. Um, and, and the D word is really a four letter word. So I, I tried to avoid that with all the patients. I think um, you hit on a really important note about the Mediterranean diet when you were talking about healthy fats, right? And that's why the Mediterranean diet was successful and a low fat diet really failed, right? So in the Mediterranean diet, they added in a liter of uh, olive oil, right? Was sent to each study participant. They had a liter a week to use as, as well as a, another uh, arm had extra walnuts um, and almonds delivered to them. So this is a, more of a high fat diet compared to what we typically think of as a restricted diet. So um, we should be enjoying the things we eat and then, the other point I, I just wanted to um, to say is that the the micronutrients are so important too, right? And so when we have a plate that's like very colorful and tasty and we're looking forward to eating it, right? We're doing more than just those macros, right? It's all these elements uh, and minerals that we're really deprived of in uh, a more packaged diet. So um, thank you yeah. for that overview. I think that's- no, Thank you. And, and to touch on the olive oil piece, the fat in your diet, so for example, olive oil poured on top of steamed vegetables actually helps you absorb a lot of the phytonutrients and the antioxidants. So a plate of steamed vegetables with no fat at all, you're actually missing out on not only the fat soluble vitamins, but a lot of the uh, fat soluble antioxidants. So for people who sort of came of age in the era of the, the low fat, high carb snack well chocolate chip cookies kind of thing, that turned out to be a disaster and it was largely promoted by the food industry and the sugar industry to try to get people off of carbs, but replacing it, I mean, sorry, off of fats and replacing it with refined carbs and sugar, which turned out to promote a lot of obesity, a lot of inflammation, a lot of glucose intolerance and diabetes. So I do actually wanna ask you, Alison, a quick question before we move on, which is a study came out this week and it was just in the New England Journal of Medicine and it showed that people who ate a low glycemic index diet had a lower risk of heart attack and stroke than people who ate high glycemic index processed foods. And can you explain what does that mean, a glycemic index, and how does that play into this whole conversation about carbs and fats and how, what kinds of choices it should uh, push us towards? Yeah, so uh, great question. So the glycemic index looks at uh, how much uh, sugar, how much glucose you get per amount of food, right? So things that are notoriously high are things that are processed. Um, and that term I think is sometimes confusing to people because people say, oh, I don't eat any processed food, which they mean as I don't go to McDonald's, but guess what? If it has a label and it has more than a couple things on it, that's processed food, right? There's things that are hidden in there. And it turns out, unfortunately, that a lot of the things we accept as normal are really processed. And if you read labels, there is sugar with various names added to almost everything. And those are the things that have a high glycemic index, right? So for a little taste, you get a really big increase in your blood glucose level levels versus things that come out of the ground, right? So your um, 
your vegetables, um, things like eggs, um, olive oil have a very low glycemic index. Um, so, so that's really highlights the importance of eating things that are unprocessed and paying attention to those labels. Um, if you do really enjoy, you know, your pantry and your packaged food, but then you just have to be smart about making sure your choices um, really contain the things that you think you're eating. And what about fats? I'm sorry, just one quick question. Fats versus carbs in terms of glycemic index. So if you wanted to have even an apple or a piece of watermelon that has a high glycemic index when eaten on an empty stomach, because it's a pure carb and a pure sugar, is there a way to incorporate those healthy foods, but lower the glycemic index by say adding a fat or a protein to it? So great question. And those things usually pair together, right? So if you're eating something sweet, you probably aren't going to eat that sweet thing alone. You really are looking, you know, to, to pair it with something. Um, uh, and, and by adding the protein or the fat, um, the transit time in your GI tract is actually lengthened. So you might get less of a spike in your blood sugar. You might enjoy it more. Um, and then you hopefully will also get less of a spike in your insulin level, right? And so insulin is the hormone that's released in response to our blood sugar, right? To get the the sugar out of the blood, um, and it's really the safe fat for winter hormone, right? So if if we're being mindful of the things we eat, we want to have a low glycemic index, things that don't cause a big spike um, in our insulin. So choosing things that are have a lower glycemic index, less processed, or or pairing foods that are sweeter with things that have more protein um, can help to kind of blunt that insulin response. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to. Um, and great reminders, Brian. Please add. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment because it's it's such a lively discussion and so important. A couple of comments. One is uh, we've done several webinars uh, over the year that are available on our website for people to listen to, and several of them have been by nutritionists and and a, a lively discussion about you know the pros and cons of different uh, nutritional plans and so there's so much data out there and there's so much information and misinformation but as people can realize and recognize from just this little discussion how we need to personalize uh, um, advice for our patients as well and how important it is to spend the time with with people to understand what their nutritional barriers are and, and how they can make those changes because uh, you know at the end of the day and when hopefully we get time to kind of meld all of these pillars together the nutrition and the exercise and, and the understanding and the whys and the what's because for some people it becomes so complex that it it, it creates a a um, you know inertia, uh, uh, people they get crippled by the amount of information and so they can't do it. And so sometimes for some people, we have to really simplify things and make it much more attainable and achievable. So I just, just wanted to uh, bring that forward because we have so much information to give. So we've got lots of webinars coming up as well. Um, and I think and part of what you all do so masterfully is as an audience, we know these things and you're inspiring us to apply them and you're giving us the why. So thanks. I mean, I'm so impressed with how you're breaking it down because it's one thing to know something. It's another thing to actually do it right and incorporate it into your daily life. So this is a perfect segue into stress and I'll tell you why. I don't know how many of you, but I certainly do use eating sometimes instead of just purely as nutrition as a way of dealing with stress. So I'm curious to hear about other ways people are dealing with stress. And Dr. Hedgepeth, for you, one of the pillars is how do we deal with stress in a constructive way so that it's not harming our health? Um, so that is a great segue um, because I think all of us are living very differently now than we were a year ago. And I know myself, I don't do well with uncertainty. And this pandemic has been extremely stressful for ways, for reasons that I think are sometimes hard to articulate because you think your day to day, right? I'm with my kids, I'm with my colleagues, I'm cooking, right? There, there is uh, some consistency, but there is this underlying stress. So, um, so it's so important for us to be talking about it. Um, unfortunately, you know, stress goes really hand in hand with anxiety and depression. 
And these are really common diagnoses in our society. Up to a quarter of people have this diagnosis and it's even higher in patients that have cardiovascular disease. So it certainly is something that um, we need to talk about out loud. Um, we need to acknowledge that a lot of times you might feel down or blue um, and uh, you're not feeling happy. Um, and you don't wanna just um, hide that fact and ignore how you're feeling. I think we need really um, more advanced coping strategies to understand that. So when I think about stress, um, I'm kind of uh, trying to simplify it and think about our nervous system, right? So it's really our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight, right? I'm going to be eaten by a tiger and I have to run. Um, as we've evolved, um, we know that we don't have to be in that dangerous situation. We can just be thinking <laughs> about being eaten by a tiger or be thinking about not seeing our family members or be thinking about work-related stress, right? And we have the same physiologic emotion as if we were really in that stressful situation, right? So our adrenaline level goes up, our cortisol level goes up, when cortisol is up, guess what? Our insulin level is up. So we have a whole host of hormones that are taking off in response um, to what we're perceiving as stress. So um, I, I do wanna show one slide. Um, should I share screen here? You want me to do that? Um, uh, sure. Um, if, you, if you could fast forward. Um, are you, are you sharing? Yeah, I'm going to, okay. Yeah, you wanna fast forward? To the heart and the hand. I've used this before. So, um, um, those are the slides. And while we're waiting to get the slides, please, any questions you have, type into the chat. We will have a few minutes for Q&A, type into the Q&A. Or if you have comments, please type them into the chat. We are saving them and we'll look at the comments. And if you have questions, I look forward to getting to the panelists with some of your questions afterwards. So are we ready to slide share? Well, that, that's okay if it's not there, but I have a cute little cartoon. Did that cause you stress? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, did your cortisol that's right, it's high, it's high. I have a cute little slide of a heart walking with a brain. Yeah, I've got um, okay. and And I think that just to have this image in our minds is so important because our, our brain is really controlling a lot of our cardiovascular response. And here the heart's leading the brain and it really should be the other way around. But the more tools that we have to really control our emotions and understand our stress, I think gives us really tremendous ability um, to take back control uh, over stress and its cardiovascular um, implications. I, I wanna just share um, one study with everybody because you know I want you to walk away feeling like we really talked about some science today. Um, there's a researcher in Stanford, Dr. Sapolsky, who's in the neuroscience division um, there. And he did some sleep studies in uh, young healthy people and looked at their cortisol level. So the first group, he said, we're gonna wake you up at 4 a.m., go to sleep. And so at 3 a.m., they had this nice increase in their cortisol level. Cortisol is the get ready for um, the day hormone as well. So all of us have a natural spike in the morning, but it certainly goes up it, when we're anticipating things, right? The next night, he said, I am going to wake you up, but I'm not going to tell you when. And guess what? The cortisol level stayed up for the entire night. So... I just want to highlight that this past year, I think all of us are living in this kind of heightened state of awareness um, and being aware of that and, and finding strategies to release your stress is really important, which is a nice tie back to Dr. Bilchek's lecture on exercise. 
because we also have some really good science saying that exercise is one of the most powerful medications we have to combat stress, anxiety, and even depression. When studied head to head um, with the use of certain antidepressants, exercise did just as well. So for all of you that um, feel a little bit of the stress from um, the way we've been living this year, I think there, there is hope um, for all of us to, to, to gain control over our um, emotions. Um, Are we ready just to take a couple of questions? I think you said that so well, just a reminder, just to reinforce that point that, uh, you know, exercise is one of the most underutilized forms of an antidepressant and one of the most effective. That's what I've got from today amongst many other things. Dr. Hedgepeth, just a couple of questions regarding nutrition that people have come up with. With You said sweet with what, somebody said. You described the pairings, you mentioned sweets with what else? So if you add that to protein, it will blunt the glycemic index. So a, a great example is putting peanut butter on an apple, as Dara said, or if you're gonna have um, a cracker, you put some cheese on it, right? So that you don't get the spike in your blood sugar from the cracker. Um, you know, and while we're talking about this, I think this is important to highlight that there is not one diet for everyone. So I think we have the best data from the Mediterranean diet, right? And that's where we go from taking population science, right? We're studying thousands of people and applying it to the individual. And when we're really trying to figure out your individual diet, well, we need to take into account your family history, your genetics, your laboratory work, right? And then really dive down more specific. I can tell you from just looking at somebody, you cannot guess how they'll handle a sugar load, right? And the complexity is, is if I eat um, a meal, a, a, an apple and peanut butter, and you look at my blood sugar, it's gonna be different than the blood sugar of Dr. Lee Lewis and Dr. Bilchek. Um, and to make it even more complicated than that, if if you eat it in the morning compared to your own body and you eat it in the evening, guess what? Your blood sugar is gonna be different. So it is really um, complex. And so I, I definitely do wanna say, you know, we, we try to make general recommendations, but um, if, if you have something specific going on, we really have to talk on a one-to-one on -a -one basis and figure out what the best diet is for you. And that's so unique about your practice. I always think of Dr. Lowne's book, The Lost Art of Healing. I think all of you have found the art of healing in your holistic approach. I'm going to go through a couple of the questions and whoever would like to answer them, please do. And that is, is there any downside to taking low dose melatonin to aid with sleep? Oh, we didn't even, we didn't even cover sleep. So oh, perfect segue. That is, thank you. Um, so, um, you know, like stress, Sleep problems is something that really affects everybody. So um, before I get to the melatonin question, let me just go through a, a brief overview. You want me because, to bring your slides back up? Sure. Um, if we can do it, otherwise I'll just- Yeah, yeah no problem. Can we just- um, Okay, ready. Here we go. So it's interesting, again, how many hours of sleep do you get? what is considered normal for some people and others. So we're excited to hear about Dr. Hedgepeth and what you have to say about Okay, so I, one I was them. really proud of my cartoons, so you can go forward one. Um, this one I love because this is how I look most nights. I, I'm, not, I'm not a good sleeper <clears throat> in full disclosure. And I think there's people out there that are really great sleepers and there are people that are not great sleepers. And there is definitely a connection between poor sleep and stress. And I love this slide because it really highlights it, right? Because the more sleep deprived you get, then the more stressed you get. And it's just unfortunately a, a vicious cycle. So hopefully that um, resonates with some people out there. But um, Sleep disorders or problems related to sleep really affect over 50 million Americans. So this again is not something that's rare. I mean, this is something that's, um, that's really common. And we know that there are significant public um, health concerns related to poor sleep. Um, the World Health Organization has labeled poor sleep as a carcinogen. So we know that it's bad for us. And there's also many studies that highlight the association between poor sleep and cardiovascular disease. I wanna share with you a couple of studies 
Um, the first I don't have a slide for, but I think is really interesting and, and everybody should um, be aware of this data because it's almost like we are um, uh, living through a science experiment every year because when we spring forward to go on to daylight savings time, we're all sleep deprived that day. And when you look at the registry for heart attacks, we see an uptick with that just small um, sleep deprivation in the incidence of heart attacks. And then in the fall, when we gain an hour, guess what? The incidence goes down. So that doesn't mean if you lose an hour of sleep, you're gonna have a heart attack, but it means if you have risk factors and you're not living the best version of yourself, um, adding one more thing to the mix sometimes is enough to really um, push you into a, an unstable disease state, which of course we're trying um, to prevent. Um, there also are other studies um, trying to get at the causal nature of sleep deprivation. And that was the slide that was up there. So I don't know yep. how easy it is to share that again. If, if not, I'll just keep talking. Hopefully people are understanding what I'm saying. Um, this is a study that was conducted a couple of years ago, really large study that had uh, over 400,000 participants um, and looked at self-reported short sleep or long sleep and, tra and track these people for almost a decade. So if you said you slept less than six hours a night, you were at higher risk for developing a heart attack. And if you slept over nine hours a night, um, which we think is a, a marker of something else going on, either significant depression or other illnesses um, causing you to sleep so much, in both cases, um, your risk of having a cardiac event really um, increased compared to people that sleep um, between seven or eight hours. So if you go to the next slide. So I just like to put the plug in that we should all have our detective hat on and we should really be trying to figure out if we're not sleeping well, why we're not sleeping well. And if you're sleeping short, right? Be kind to yourself and put away the to-do list. If if you know, be a kind partner and um, maybe let your spouse off the hook that um, instead of getting chores done, they should you know, protect their bedtime. Um, so you know, we're aiming for seven to eight hours a night. And I think some of us know we need more and some of us seem to get a away with less. Um, you can't shrink that too much less than seven hours. Um, but I think you wanna really concentrate on what a typical routine is for you. Um, and if you're not in bed, um, longer than you need to sleep, guess what? There's no chance that you're gonna get adequate sleep. So protecting your time is um, probably the first place to start. Um, we also like to look um, at other um, things that might disrupt our sleep. So making sure the room is cold and dark and also removing things that might disrupt your sleep, which um, pets, kids, and sadly sometimes spouses um, need to be removed so that we really are all protected um, in our sleep environment. Um, so back to the melatonin question. Um, I think um, a, a low dose of melatonin is not associated with any health consequences. Before I would reach for any medications, I would do the hard homework of really figuring out what your routine is, why you're not sleeping well, are you having trouble falling asleep? Are you waking up ruminating, thinking about things? You know, what is the issue? Um, and uh, for, for many people that consistency is enough to really smooth out any, um, you know, small changes that they've noted in their sleep. Um, when there's bigger things going on, sometimes we really need a cognitive behavioral therapist to help us um, really identify these issues. And then um, certainly there are some, some real significant health consequences related to poor sleeping. So sleep apnea is a great example. So apnea is not just disturbed sleep. Apnea is where your oxygen level actually dips at night and is low. And that's really associated with resistant hypertension and atrial fibrillation. So um, we've, we've had other uh, webinars where we've talked about um, some of those more severe consequences. And um, there's also some resources and blogs on our website as well, if you're interested in this. But in those situations, we have to do more than just you know journal and try to relax. We really need to be doing more testing. 
I wish we would get to all the questions. We probably won't, but I'm going to answer the ones that I feel haven't been answered, if that's okay. Like, does your practice offer all the tests that you reference? So I'll, I'll address that. I, I think what's so interesting about our current time is that we're in a very exciting exploration of uh, risk factor uh, uh, identification and management and, and what we call personalized medicine, whether it's a, a genetic kind of test or uh, individual lipid testing or personalized, uh, you know, uh, intervention. So we actually do offer a whole lot of uh, personalized uh, evaluations and testing and counseling in this regard. Um, I think what's so critical here is um, the, the factor of time and, and each one of these topics we could have spent hours on and I, I wish we could address all of the, the questions. What's intriguing to me is, um, you know, we, we're living in an era of COVID COVID has killed over 500,000 people. Way more people have died from heart disease. So we have to keep, put that in uh, perspective and keep that into, in, in perspective. So heart disease and chronic disease is still the number one major killer. And the other uh, factor is that we've had so much technologic advancement that there was a, a improvement in lifespan. But now that has plateaued and actually started to dip a little bit. And so what are the areas that still need a, a lot of attention? And, and this risk factor modification, these four pillars are essential as we think about each individual patient and the individualized therapies and, and interventions for them. So uh, we uh, have a very comprehensive uh, uh, practice, as most of the audience knows. We uh, do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, evaluation and history taking, and a lot of the uh, data is attained from the history, the physical examination. We resort to testing uh, when necessary, and we only use testing when we know what we're going to do with the results. We've got a, a full non-invasive testing facility here, but we also have the ability to do all these more advanced personalized lipid testing and other uh, uh, in interventions, looking at uh, body habitus, for example, and, and muscle uh, fat ratios and, and seeing how different interventions, whether it's nutrition or exercise can modify that. The other thing I wanna say, and this will be the last thing I say is that many people have asked uh, the question about what to start first? Should I do all, can I deal with all of these things together or is there a priority? And I always tell my patients that you can't really start a strict nutritional plan until you're, uh, you've started a, an exercise program. I feel that is the primal uh, uh, intervention that one has to have because when you're feeling stronger and healthier you're able to make better choices it's very hard to change your diet and how you feel and then have the energy to kind of get into an exercise program but you cannot lose weight with exercise Exos you cannot uh, lose weight without exercise but you cannot lose weight with exercise alone so if that's the goal of health and I, I think this this concept what is ideal uh, um, health and and um, body weight and body mass and, and all the kinds of things that we need to kind of rethink because too skinny is not so good either. So there, there's health related uh, um, issues that we have to address. And I think um, I'm going to put my plug in for exercise first and then uh, the other pieces may fall in place, but you have to do them together. Dr. Hedgepath, Dr. Lewis, looking through the questions, please let me know if there's any specific question you think we haven't addressed or you would like to. We try during these sessions and get to everyone and cover as much as possible. So apologies if we haven't got to yours. Is there anything specific, Dr. Lewis or Dr. Hedgepath, that you saw that you would like to address? So many good questions in here, let's see. I wondered about this one, about can you take a number of factors, family history, lipids, comorbidity, et cetera, and have a risk profile with this help? Also, is there utility in getting a calcium scan if at high risk? Sure, yeah, I'll start with that and now can you elaborate? So yes, there are many risk profiles out there. There's formulas online, you can Google them through the American Heart Association where you can plug in your risk factors and the traditional risk factors for developing a heart attacks and stroke would be high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, 
smoking and then genetics. So a positive family history of a heart attack or stroke in a first degree family relative, usually a male family, a male relative before the age of 50, a female relative before the age of 60 who's had a heart attack or a stroke. So those things can be put together to come up with your individual risk of having a heart attack or stroke. And that helps us decide how aggressive to be, for example, in treating your cholesterol with a statin medication. So the answer to the question, yes, there are risk profiles. The calcium score is a very interesting um, way to do a very fast CT scan of the heart arteries, and it's looking for calcium in the heart arteries. And the reason it's doing that is that when we're born, our arteries are muscular tubes that have no calcium in them at all. And as we get older and we're exposed to these risk factors I was speaking about, people tend to develop early and then more progressive plaque and atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries, of which calcium is a component of it. So this picks up the calcium as an early marker of atherosclerosis. That has now been added to the American Heart Association recommendations to look for heart disease in someone who has not yet been diagnosed with it, in someone who's at intermediate risk. So if you're at very low risk, so you have none of those risk factors I spoke about and your family history is squeaky clean, we don't recommend a calcium score just because that minimal bit of radiation risk isn't worth it. Because no matter what that shows, first off, it's very likely to be low. And second off, we don't recommend statin medications in people who are at very low risk of having a heart attack or stroke. And in people who are at high risk, we also don't recommend a calcium score because we already know we need to be very, very aggressive on all those risk factors. We really need to get your blood sugar down. We need to get the cholesterol down, usually with a statin, all those things I spoke about. But that intermediate risk group where you say, hi, I've got a few risk factors, but not all of them. And my cholesterol is kind of borderline. Should I be on a statin or not? That's the perfect person where we would use a calcium score to help us break the tie. Is there a specific age that every single person should come and visit the cardiologist just to double check? Oh, it's a good question. Alison, do you want to take that one? Um, sure. You know, we talk a lot about this when we're specifically talking about the women's program, because I think sometimes we really think that men carry a lot more cardiovascular risk than women do. And so when women hit the late 60s, guess what? that risk is equal to men. And then into your 70s girls, your risk actually supersedes that of men. Um, and because cardiovascular disease, um, I'm sad to say, is the final common pathway for most of us, everybody needs to care about this, right? And I think if we're doing our job right, we're really looking at your specific risk factors, identifying them, and then controlling them, right? So that what we were hoping to do, right, is push off disease, right? Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, so that you're dealing with issues, right? But not in your 70s, in your 90s, right? Not at age 65, right? But well into your 80s. Um, and, and, and able to live the life that you want to live. Um, in order to do that, you really have to know your specific risks. So I think that's where doing the lipid panel, using the calculators, doing advanced imaging, which is sometimes that calcium score, and sometimes it's um, it's even more sophisticated imaging. But it really depends on you know the specifics of each individual. I want to just make a quick comment. comment. Quick okay. comment about that. And I, I don't think you can start too soon to risk factor modify. And, and uh, there's something called primordial prevention. So uh, we know that uh, babies born uh, from moms who haven't taken good care of themselves are much higher risk for uh, chronic disease and atherosclerosis as they age. And so I would say, uh, since we only see people over the age of 16, that uh, that's when they should see their cardiologist for prevention. Um, you know, you don't want to wait too late. Primary prevention is much more challenging than secondary prevention. In other words, when someone's already had a cardiac event, it's easy to motivate people to make healthier choices and better behaviors. But the younger you can get those healthier habits. And here's the thing I would say also important is modeling. So if you have children or grandchildren and you don't model healthy behaviors, you're not helping them and, and you're increasing their risk of uh, atherosclerosis and, and cardiovascular disease and chronic illness as they age. So I, don't, I just don't think you can start too soon. 
On a very practical note, people are going, do I come into the office, don't I? Can you tell us about your group? And I know you are open for business with all the health measures in place, but for those of us who are going, yes, we need to book an appointment now. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll make a quick comment about this. So I, I feel like the, uh, the state is opening way too quickly. I think we're at a point where we really need to vaccinate a lot more people. Um, and um, unfortunately, the distribution of vaccines, as everyone knows, has been a, a very frustrating process. I would say the numbers are coming down. And uh, so that makes everyone feel a little safer. We've been open and practicing every single pr safe precaution we have, but the numbers of patients we can see is obviously a lot less. Uh, but that gives me people more time to spend. Um, and I think the opportunity to see people in person, but also to uh, uh, consult virtually like this and, and be able to uh, speak without a mask is very, very healthful as well. So um, we, um, you know, our staff all vaccinated, we are all uh, taking every precaution. Um, our air exchange is outstanding in the office. Um, we are doing stress tests and we are uh, following every single uh, safety precaution we can. We do the echocardiograms. Um, we're, we're protecting our patients, we're protecting our staff and we, and I'm touching wood, we have not had one uh, event or concerning uh, feature at all. So I had the slide up with all the contact details, how we reach you. Uh, Dr. Lee Lewis, you may have more success than I did there. It is exactly four o'clock. So first of all, we want to thank each and every one of our remarkable doctors for joining us with their expertise today. I always say having all of you talk to us is one very expensive consultation. And here you had this beautiful advice and guidance um, because they are just a remarkable, remarkable group of individuals. And by the way, Dr. Lewis, Dr. Bilchik and Dr. Hedgepeth, that comes through. It would be very difficult to choose which one of you to see. A final word from each of you as we continue to navigate COVID-19 and this rather uncertain time in our lives. So we'll go in alphabetical order. We will start with Alison, then Brian, and then Dara. Um, thank you everybody for listening today. And uh, you know, I just wanna go full circle and come back to the exercise piece because Brian started with that. And I get asked all the time, what do I do if I don't like exercise? And I just want, you know, if, if that's you and you're listening, your homework is to go out and figure out a way that you can have fun with that. Because I hope it, it shows from this how important exercise is and that feeling connected and that um, levity piece um, with the exercises is, is just as important, I think, as the exercise. So I'll I'm end going to slip slow. in one more question before we get to you, Brian, and that is how does heart medication affect all four pedestals? So if you could answer that and give us our call to action, and then we'll go to Dara. So that's the uh, next uh, webinar, because this was the non-pharmacologic uh, uh, um, interventions for vascular health. Um, but yes, we, we uh, utilize all the tools we can, including medications. And, and we, uh, there are a lot of good medications out there. And obviously there's a lot of concern about medications and side effects, uh, just like there are concerns about the vaccines and the potential uh, uh, you know, side effects and, and concerns about that. Um, I just want to uh, say that during uh, COVID, we've all had an opportunity to uh, experience uh, untold stress and our opportunity now as the light is at the end of the tunnel or we can see the light at the end of the tunnel is to uh, reflect on the year and then reset of how we can do better next uh, year, this year, with ourselves, with uh, with others, how important social networking is and these interactions are, whether they're in person or virtual, there is benefit. I can't wait to give, uh, you know, uh, my friends and families hugs and uh, be able to uh, speak to them freely without wearing a mask, but I'm not sure when that will happen. So hang in there, uh, be patient and set realistic goals. Tara? Yes, and I want to say thank you also to you, Nadia, to my wonderful colleagues, everyone for joining. And 
my take home message is just be kind to yourself, forgive yourself. We've all been through so much and we've done the best we can. So moving forward, every choice we make about when to move, how to move, what we eat uh, is important. And we don't always make 100% of the right choices, but we do what we can, do the best you can. It really does pay off in terms of well being and health and any way that we can help you achieve that, we want to be there to help you do it. And I'll end with a Charles Dewey quote, and that is, you make your habits and your habits make you. And I ask each and every person after this webinar, three things. What as a result of what was shared today, do you want to stop doing? What do you want to start doing? And what do you want to continue doing? So on behalf of the Lowen Medical Cardiology Group, it has been a great pleasure and we look forward to bringing you more information and looking at how we can help you get healthier as we navigate what we call VUCA times, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Many thank yous from many people, great information shared, and lots of questions. So thank you to everybody. Thank you. And if people have other questions that they would like to ask you, where do they submit them? Um, yeah, great question. So uh, if, it's, if you are our patient, just reach out to us directly. If you wanna find out more about the practice, the slide I just showed had a place to call to get more information about the practice. And if you can submit, we're about to send everybody a feedback form that we hope you'll fill out to give us ideas for future webinars and let us know how this went. And you can you can ask questions in there, but it's not easy for us to answer all of them. So um, there's not an easy answer to that question because sometimes we have over 150 people on this webinar and we won't be able to answer everybody's questions individually, I'm afraid. So if you really want your questions answered, you need to make an appointment as soon as possible because interesting enough, more people have died or had health-related heart disease than COVID-19. And I understand, and am I correct, that heart disease is actually the number one cause of death amongst women over a certain age. Is that true or false? Yes, after the age of about 60, 65. It's actually the leading cause of death in men and women. Um, one out of three men and women will die of heart disease and women exceed men after the age of about. So you're now joining us for the webinar after party. So for those of you who'd like to join, stay, ask questions, but we really are navigating this. You guys, what great information. Um, and I'm interested to see what happens with the next one. So this was with no rehearsal. So can you imagine if we do <laughs> And I'll just tell everyone, two weeks from today is our next webinar, and it's going to be on transcendental meditation. So someone has suggested that meditation is one way without medications to improve stress and sleep. And I will say we'll find out more two weeks from today. So thank you. Thank you all. Stay healthy, stay well, and don't forget the Laun Cardiology Group is very much open to see you and to help you get heart healthy.